The U.S. Supreme Court engraved this right in concrete when it ruled same-sex marriage is constitutional. The history of the campaign for marriage equality goes back to 1970, when two male University of Minnesota students applied for a marriage license and were denied because they were both men. Since then, the law and American public opinion have revolutionized fairly quickly. But despite this, the United Methodist Church has not progressed in this critical regard. The church remains officially opposed to homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and self-avowed gay pastors. Its official rule book, the Book of Discipline, states the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. But not all United Methodist congregations agree with the church's view on this issue. The fight on this issue is testing the faith more than ever and dividing the United Methodist Church. <laughs> Capital Pride is an annual event in Washington, D.C., celebrating the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning communities. It brings together national and local LGBTQ organizations as well as supporters, from politicians to corporate chieftains and church groups. One church supporting the LGBT community is Washington, D.C.-based Foundry United Methodist Church. Founded in 1814, Foundry has a long history of being open and welcoming to the LGBTQ community. Pastor Ginger is head pastor at Foundry. For you the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Pastor Ginger, the Book of Discipline says homosexuality is a sin. How do you deal with that, being a part of the UMC? I'm definitely part of the United Methodist Church, and from the day that I was ordained, um, in which I said that I would support the doctrine of the church, I knew that I would be working to change what the Book of Discipline says about uh, homosexuality. I think the Book of Discipline is counter to the Word of God that we find in Scripture. So the way I deal with the Book of Discipline is to fight it. Pastor Ginger and the Foundry congregation are not fighting alone. They belong to the Reconciling Ministries Network, or RMN, a grassroots organization of congregations and communities committed to the full inclusion of LGBTQ persons in the life and ministries of the United Methodist Church. Our denomination supports the civil rights of LGBTQ persons in the world, but denies those rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, and rights, R-I-T-E-S, within the church. The Reverend Dr. Karen Olivetto is one of the leaders of RMN and pastor at Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco, one of the most diverse, open, and controversial United Methodist churches in the U.S. Go to show that you are a Christian by your love. Every church has to do that moral inventory. Whose dignity are we not honoring? Unfortunately, the biggest one right now, because it's written into the rule book, it's okay to tell a lesbian or gay person I'm not going to baptize you. I'm not going to receive you into membership. I'm not going to honor your call to ministry. And I'm not going to marry you. That's the only group that is officially written into our book of rules. The founder of the United Methodist Church, John Wesley, is often quoted as saying, though we may not all think alike, may we not all love alike. The battle over gay inclusion has been going on within the church for 40 years, and at the center, is interpretation of scripture. You can fault the United Methodist Church for many things, but one thing you cannot fault us for is an unwillingness to discuss this issue. You have forgiven our sins. Reverend Rob Renfro is a pastor at the 11,000 member Woodlands Congregation in suburban Houston, Texas. 
He is also the president of Good News, a national organization that calls itself the leading evangelical advocate for the UMC. Although many look upon those who are associated with Good News as the anti-gay faction within the church, Renfro says for him, other clergy, and many UMC members, it's about following scripture. My position regarding uh, same-sex marriages in the United Methodist Church and ordaining openly gay practicing persons is the same as the United Methodist Church's position. Uh, we believe that all persons are persons of sacred worth, all people should be and are welcome in our churches. But the Bible is very clear about same gender sexual relations in a negative way and the United Methodist Church has uh, decided that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. And our church's position is that we simply cannot marry two people the same gender because I believe the scriptures are God's word. This is the word of God for the people of God. Jones Memorial senior pastor Kenneth Livingston says traditionalists are open to debate about scripture, but God's word stands. I absolutely believe that could be misinterpretation because we're human along the way. But I think again, if you simply look, and, and I've asked this question of persons on the other side, would you show me, just point out to me, one scripture in the Bible, any scripture in the Bible in which homosexuality is seen in a positive light? No one's able to do that. Now they can tell me a lot of other scriptures about other subjects, but when I say, let's talk about this subject, you can't do that. And so for me, I'm gonna have to come down the side of what scripture says, as opposed to what even my, my brothers and sisters whom I love feel in their hearts. The United Methodist Church traces its roots back to the 1700s and the leadership of British evangelist John Wesley. Wesley and the early Methodists placed primary emphasis on Christian living, putting faith and love into action, or practical divinity. Unlike the Catholic Church, which has an individual executive who dictates policy, the UMC's authority is with a global legislative body. The General Conference is made up of clergy and laity and meets every four years. In 1984, the General Conference added to its Book of Discipline the statement that, quote, no self-avowed practicing homosexual shall be ordained or appointed in the United Methodist Church, end quote. And in 1996, a policy forbidding any same-sex commitment ceremonies to be celebrated in the United Methodist Churches or by United Methodist pastors was adopted. With society accepting and more UMC clergy accepting the LGBTQ community, many believe anti-homosexuality policies would be removed from the Book of Discipline at the General Conference in 2012. But after much debate, removing the policies was voted down. Even a proposal to replace the policy with a statement noting the disagreement was voted down. It was that 2012 General Conference that was galvanizing for me because I had lived with the, uh, I guess, illusion, comforting illusion that the church was going to change uh, with time and history would change our attitudes, but it did not happen. And it became very clear at that conference when the vote was uh, 61 to 39 percent that the church had actually hardened on this issue. The debate is not only dividing the church, according to the Public Religion Research Institute survey, it is also causing the UMC to lose members, especially millennials. If we can't get clear and give a clear message to the world around us that the church is open to all people, then people are going to continue to, to not want to have anything to do with us. The failure to change the Book of Discipline also emboldened many pastors to officiate at same-sex marriages. This is a new covenant. Protests erupted in 2013 when Reverend Frank Schaefer of Pennsylvania was put on trial within the church for officiating at his gay son's wedding. He was found guilty lost his ministerial credentials and his congregation. It is such a joy and an honor to be back in my home church 
Although Reverend Schaefer was later reinstated, other pastors are facing charges and trials for officiating at same-sex weddings and being openly gay. Reverend Benjamin Hutchison, an openly gay African Methodist Episcopal pastor, was forced to resign from his church because of his relationship with his spouse. Those who God and the law join together, let no one put a the week after his resignation, he married his partner with support from local UMC clergy, nine of whom had complaints filed against them for co-presiding at the wedding. Reverend John Copenhaver decided to go public in 2013 with his opposition to the church's policies on same-sex marriage and encouraged others in the Virginia Conference to follow. A year later, he took a riskier step officiating at his friend's and colleague's same-sex wedding. There was risk in the sense that I was going against friends and colleagues in the Virginia Conference, and it was the first person in the Southeast jurisdiction, as far as I know, to um, challenge the church's teaching on that. It was very important to me that we would be uh, married under God, so to speak, that we would be married um, in a religious and civil ceremony. Sarah and I work in ministry together. It's at the core of what we do. And so it seemed silly to go to a justice of the peace. But it was their circumstance that pushed John to defy the church. My uh, sister was murdered um, back in September of 2014. Um, her three children would have been separated into different homes. Um, they, there wasn't another place for them to go. Um, the state of Virginia had made it very clear that two people who are cohabiting and not married um, would not be able to foster or kinship care their children of interest. John was thrilled he could help Sarah and Delyn. Initially, I was elated. <laughs> I was so thrilled because I, you know, we had broken through a lot of barriers. I had been preparing myself for this. The next day, though, when I called my district superintendent, it was a sobering moment because he did feel that I had broken covenant with the church, which to me is a, a very painful statement to make, you know, a charge to make that I had broken covenant with the church. At the time, it was, it was painful to hear. A complaint was filed against John. After months of negotiations, he was suspended for three months. My argument later on was that I had not broken covenant with the church, that, that it was the United Methodist Church that taught me to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form as they present themselves. We're both grateful um, for people like John who are willing to do the right thing, no matter what the consequences are, because the consequences could be very harsh and he was willing to accept those consequences. Um, and so I'm grateful and I would assume that you are as well. Sarah and Delyn are now able to have all three children in their care. Located in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley, Harrisonburg, Virginia is home to RISE, a United Methodist Church, which every Sunday transforms the local Court Square Theater into a place of worship. Rise is an open community where everyone is welcome. In 2012, Pastor Amanda Miller Garber was asked by two members to officiate at their same sex wedding. After much thought, Pastor Amanda declined to perform the wedding. I took my ordination vows very seriously, and I am not one to run around willy nilly breaking promises to others and to God. And I had lived in this very painful, difficult place with what the Book of Discipline says for a long time. But at that point in time, I was simply too um, fearful of what the repercussions would be. Also, Rise was very, very young at that point. We're five now. But we were in this space where I was not sure that as a community we could withstand what could happen. And then I went to General Conference and I experienced the venom 
and the rhetoric and the fear, the nauseating fear. Two years later, she was asked again. This time her answer was yes. I had an indescribable sense that this is what God wanted me to do. And it wasn't like glowing on the mountaintop or fireworks or it's not the most dramatic kind of God message. It was just peace. It was just absolute peace. When we can celebrate with your son at his heavenly banquet where all are feasting together and all are truly welcome. The number one thing that has changed me, that has transformed me, that emboldened me to marry Brittany and Lindsay has been relationship and stories and sitting with people who have shown me the cut marks on their arms, who have shown me the scars from where they've attempted suicide, who have left me speechless who have trusted me enough to share their pain and their deep desire for companionship and love. Let us pray. That peace didn't last long. 36 hours after the marriage, she received a call from her superintendent telling her a complaint was filed. I didn't know if I would have a job at the end, if I would have credentials, I, what would be left of Rise, I didn't know. She was suspended from her congregation for a month without pay. Part of the punishment was that she could have no contact with her church community. She was also a target in the community. I affectionately call it the season of public shaming uh, because it's when it all went really public. And while I received indescribably powerful support, um, I received some, some pretty awful um, messages. I definitely feel like when uh, Amanda was gone, this, this place drew together, it made us stronger. It, uh, we all loved Amanda, we, uh, we missed Amanda. Uh, I think it brought Rise closer together. But the defiance by clergy is causing the church to separate even more. When a clergy from the United Methodist Church performs a same-sex marriage, it breaks my heart. I, I'm really broken over that and for many reasons, one of which is we made a covenant. We, we, we took a vow to uphold the discipline of the United Methodist Church and it clearly states that we will not perform uh, these types of ceremonies. And so it breaks my heart that we can enter into a covenant uh, before God, uh, the church and say, this is how we will live with one another and then fail to do that. In May 2014, the Good News Movement released a statement in behalf of more than 80 United Methodist pastors and theologians that called for a split in the denomination. The statement asserted, quote, we need to recognize the reality that we, laity, clergy, and even the Council of Bishops are divided and will remain divided, end quote. What I'm afraid of is this, is you have two sides who have deeply held beliefs, and honestly, neither side is going to be able to compromise their most basic principles. What I hope will not happen is that we will decide that we're going to continue to fight this battle for the next 10, 15, 20 years and see who wins. It's like we're in a cage match. Go back to the wrestling world that I grew up in. And in a cage match, the fighters could not escape each other and they could not quit fighting. And that's where we United Methodists find ourselves. I don't want to be in a cage match for the next 20 years to see who wins because the Church of Jesus Christ does not win in that narrative. To keep the church together, the well-respected Reverend Adam Hamilton, who leads the denomination's largest church in Kansas, suggested a way forward. The proposal would let local churches decide whether to host same-sex unions and welcome gay clergy, but neither side is ready to compromise. I think that it is a faithful attempt to try to keep the United Methodist Church together across particularly the issue of marriage equality. Um, but I, I, I long for and will continue to work for the day uh, when we can be more positive and clear about what it is we're ultimately wanting to see happen in the church. The way forward is presented as a compromise, but it's not a compromise. Uh, Reverend Hamilton, I know him, I know his heart, he's a good heart, great pastor, but his plan is just extremely flawed.
first of all, it's not a compromise. It's an arrangement by which the progressives do all the taking and we conservatives do all the giving. And furthermore, progressives have been even more critical of his plan than we have been. They say his plan acts as if homosexuality is the problem when they say, no, homophobia is the problem. It creates a two-tiered system. Some have referred to it as a Jim Crow system for handling this situation. And progressives have been very upfront. Even if this were to pass, they will not stop there. They will not compromise. Another suggestion to keep the church from splitting is called a third way. The Connectional Table, an official UMC leadership body, proposed removing the homosexuality language from the Book of Discipline, while recognizing the church has historically been against it. It also removes any punishment for being a practicing gay clergy or performing same-sex wedding ceremonies. The proposal will be voted on at the General Conference in 2016. Some say the global nature of the church, particularly its growth in Africa, where homosexuality is still taboo, is the major hurdle for those hoping to change church policy in 2016. Traditionalists disagree. What has been troubling to me is in the United States we have had some pastors who have disobeyed their covenant that they've entered into and have in a way um, disenfranchised the voice of our global body. Our African brothers and sisters in Asia and Eastern Europe, we all share in a voice in discerning together. What does scripture call us to that supersedes the culture that we're currently living in, even the generation that we're living in? What is the truth of Christ that transcends all of that? And that's the voice of our global church. If the church does decide to split, the division of its finances could take years to move through the courts. Smaller congregations could be left without church buildings. Now you're getting down to the where the rubber meets the road in a lot of, a lot of these cases. In terms of buildings, in terms of money, the United Methodist Connection owns, you know, we hold this building in trust for, uh, for the United Methodist Church. And so whatever, whatever structural changes happen within the denomination will affect congregations. Why do you stay with a church that isn't the headlights? Why wouldn't you go to a church that is the headlights? I stay in this church because I believe it can be the headlights and ought to be the headlights. And as the body of Christ, it should be showing the world, bearing witness to the world about what justice looks like, what liberation looks like, and what love looks like. I love the gifts that the United Methodist Church brings to the world. It shaped me, it formed me, it's so much a part of who I am that to just abandon that to those who would try to keep people out and to keep people from experiencing this way of being a Christian and a disciple of Jesus, I just, I'm not okay with that. Many gay members also feel the best way to change the church is to stay and be recognized. I was just sitting at home sort of listening to my thoughts and like and allowing God to speak to me, maybe. Um, and it just, the light bulb went off and I was like, why in the world would you make me this way and then just like label me a sinner immediately? I don't think that's what he intended. I'm going to stay in the fight. Um, and even if just staying in the fight means like that I just come to church. Neither side says it wants the church to split. And in a church that's been the spiritual home to on the one hand George W. Bush and on the other Hillary Clinton, many say they can't see why there cannot be a solution to this issue. I don't know what the future holds uh, for the United Methodist Church. The moments when I have great, great uh, hope and, and, and excitement about it, and there are days when, when I don't. I just don't know where we're going to be. But here's the good news. I know God's in control. And I know at the end of the day, God's going to be the one who decides our future for us if we're willing to uh, humble ourselves before him. The split, if it happens, will rock the church to its stone foundation. But there's a view that splitting may just be a formality since the two sides are already divided. They see the schism in the United Methodist Church 
as emblematic of the fact that LGBTQ rights in church and society are not a done deal, despite the Supreme Court's landmark decision on marriage equality giving same-sex couples equal dignity in the eyes of the law. Yeah.